be a story that I either read or that really spoke to me or even more preferably something that I have lived. Okay? But anyway, whatever it is, if you find a great story, um, that's fine. Something that just sort of introduces what you're going to be talking about here. Now, having said that, it's fair to the people that you're going to be talking to, preaching to, to let them know what you plan on covering. Okay? So sometimes your introduction can be just as simple as this. Our passage this morning that we're going to be taking a look at is Luke chapter 24. And in looking at Luke chapter 24, we're going to be examining three points. In Luke chapter 24, we're going to be examining three points, and those three points are one, two, three. That's your introduction. Okay? I call this giving, giving the lay of the land. Okay? So you view yourself as sort of the scout, as sort of the leader, and you've already been to this territory, you've already spent this week or month or whatever studying, so you know where you're headed. But may I remind you that those that are sitting in the pew did not spend the last week or the last month with you, so they don't have a clue what you're going to say. So it's a very good idea to prep them and let them know, hey, this is what we're going to be covering. The reason for this also is that it's fair to them in terms of helping them to keep organizationally straight in their mind where you're at in the sermon. If you tell them you're going to be covering three points, okay, and then you get to, if you say something like, okay, now we've looked at point number one, let's transition out to our second point, which is they know where they are in the sermon. It's a little bit like those signs, if you've ever been to those malls that sometimes are very circuitous and they're all different directions and wings and all this. You, you love to find those signs that say, you are here relative to everything else, okay? So when you organize your sermon, whether it's around two points or three points or four points or whatever it is, and you let people know, so now we're going to look at our third and final point. They know, it's just like walking up to one of those signs, and they know where they are. Does that make sense? Many people, they just start rambling, and they're off to the races, and you don't know what they're planning on covering or, or if they've even covered what they were going to. No, no, no. Whatever your introduction is, it should include a brief introduction to what you plan to cover in that presentation and how many points you plan to look at to substantiate your main point, to corroborate your main point, okay? Then you have some sort of a clear transition to the body. If you used an illustration, you want to make the illustration applicable to whatever the story is, to whatever the, the purpose is, rather, of the sermon. If you didn't use a story, then all you say is, uh, uh, the purpose of our sermon today is to show uh, that the Bible is trustworthy and in examining our thesis that the Bible is trustworthy, we will be examining three lines of evidence. We'll be looking at the Bible's unique claims, the Bible's unique content, and finally, the Bible's unique consistency. So come with me now to our first passage and our first point, which is the unique claims of Scripture. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. So now people know where we're at, why we're going to the text we're going to, and what we can expect to learn today. It's good for people because it keeps them organizationally aware of the map. You are here, and it's good for you because if you are organized in your preparation, it will make you a better communicator. How many of us have heard the pastor that just stands up, doesn't tell you what he's going to cover, how many points are in his sermon, and he's rambling, and he's told 15 stories, and you're not quite sure how they tie together, and before you know it, the sermon is over. In most cases, the sermon is not over soon enough. Okay? Have you had this experience? Okay, it's because if the person strikes you as not organized, there's a very good reason for that. They're not. Right? If, if, if what they're looking at is a disorganized, you know, assemblage of, oh, yeah, verses written in the corner here, and then, then it's going to come off looking like that, like total chaos. But if they stand up and very clearly on their notes, there's point one, point two, point three, verse under one, verse under two, two verses under three, it's going to be very difficult to communicate that in a non-organized way because, number one, they've organized it themselves in a consistent way, in an, an organizationally sound way, and number two, they've typed it out on their notes in a way that lends itself to organization. Public communication is not easy. At one level, it's very difficult, and another level, it's very easy. Okay? One of the very best things you can do to become an effective public communicator is to just ask yourself over and over and over again, not just what am I saying, but what will the people hear? Not what am I saying, but what will the people hear? And the people will do a much better job of hearing what you have to say if you tell them where it fits in the context. What, where, what puzzle piece is this, and where does it fit in the scheme? Does that make sense? So rather than just saying something profound, okay, so if we could use an illustration here, if we have, say this is a picture, and you're going to paint a picture in your sermon. If you say, um, there was a cow, 
Well, that's okay, so there was a cow. But if you let them know that that cow is standing by a stream, by way of analogy here, next to the barn, just this side of the fence, and in front of the large looming mountains, and the beautiful clouds, and the sun. Okay, so now you've told people the basic picture is a picture of a cow in front of mountains with a barn, a fence, a stream, clouds, and a sun. And now you start talking about the cow. Okay, now I have a cow in a place. But if I just say cow, now let's say that on my notes, what I'm trying to communicate is this picture, but all I do is just say cow, and cow represents here a, a, a point that you're going to make or a sentence that you're going to say or a text that you're going to go to. If I say cow, you can, get a, you can picture a cow in any number of different circumstances. You can picture a cow um, at a feedlot. You can picture a cow at a slaughterhouse. You can picture a cow at a barn. You can picture a cow at a dairy. You can picture a lot. No, 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 no. Just saying something in isolation does not help the people to know where this fits into the major picture that you're trying to paint. Does that make sense? And so he, now here's where I say public communication is easy and difficult. Many people stand up to communicate publicly, and they themselves don't even know the picture. Well, no wonder nobody else gets it. There is no picture to get. So this is why it's critical for you to know what is the purpose of my sermon. What is the single purpose of my sermon? And whatever that purpose is, you should be able to write it out in a single, simple sentence. Whatever the purpose of your sermon is, or any kind of presentation, you should be able to write it out in a single sentence simple sentence. If it takes a run-on sentence complete with commas, m dashes, and semicolons, it's three sermons or four sermons. Okay? So for example, let's go back to our sermon on the Bible. To show that the Bible is trustworthy. That's the, let's just say that was your sermon purpose. To show that the Bible is trustworthy. Or let's take one that you're going to be preaching on here coming up in just a bit. Uh, let's say that you pick the New Testament character Philemon. So you pick the New Testament character Philemon. Of course, there's only one book in the New Testament that tells us about Philemon. And let's say you're going to write about the relationship between, between Philemon and the, and the slave. And your purpose is to show that Philemon's... Ex the, 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 the person in Scripture of Philemon elucidates how we should relate to our fellow brothers and sisters. Okay, so here's your purpose. To show the principles gleaned from Philemon's story or instance in Scripture and how they relate to modern-day application, three modern-day applications of how we should treat people. That's the purpose of your sermon. Does that make sense? So if you cannot write out the single, centered, simple purpose of your sermon in a sentence, it's not, it don't, don't preach it. Because if it's not clear in your mind what you're trying to say, it certainly isn't going to be clear in anybody else's mind. If you don't know the picture and where the cow fits into the picture, nobody else is going to get it either. But if you know this, well then, part of public communication is first knowing this and then start describing to people where we're at. Start telling people, so there's, there's mountains. And in the context of those mountains, there's a farm. In fact, just in front of there's a meadow. And there's, there's a farm here and there's a barn. And it's a beautiful red barn and there's a fence that surrounds the barn and there's our cow. And our cow is standing next to a stream. Everybody has the picture in their mind. Well, the reason that you have the picture is that I know the picture and so now I'm communicating that picture to you. I'm communicating that picture to you. Making sense, everyone? Okay, so whatever your introduction is, whatever you're going to introduce, whether it's a story or whatever, transition to the body and help people to know what you'll be covering. Today we're going to be looking at purpose. We're going to be examining two lines of evidence. Three points, four verses, five examples. Obviously, you can't do five in a sermon of the length that you'll be preaching here. And then you have your points, your main points, every one of which substantiates your purpose, corroborates your purpose, upholds your purpose. One to five, three is best for new preachers. Three or two, okay? Two or three. Some very effective sermons can have as few as one, just one major point, okay? And very few sermons can have more than five effective sermons. The moment you get, if I give you a list of five things, you wouldn't remember them. If I say, I need you to go to the grocery store for me, I need you to pick up soy milk, some tomato sauce, but the organic tomato sauce. I need you to get me salsa, but the Herdez spicy salsa. I need uh, two bunches of organic bananas, slightly green, and then I need some chips, but not with the hydrogenated oil. <laughs> okay, so if I say, repeat that back to me, what do I want? Okay, okay, well, I want to hear one person do it. Oh, no. Um, 
OK, what do I want, T? What are you picking up for me? Does that have to be in the order? Just no, no, just the list. Soy milk, shrimp without the oil. What, what kind of oil? Hydrogenated oil. Very good. Carne soy milk. You're doing so good. OK, then you want tomatoes. No, wait, no sauce. <laughs> tomato sauce. Oh, you don't want sauce. Yeah. What kind of tomato sauce do I want? Uh, some, some kind. Okay. You're exactly right. I want some kind of tomato sauce. The point is this. But if I just say to you, hey, I need you to go to the store for me and pick me up some bananas, some oranges, and some apples. You got that. Bananas, oranges, apples. So uh, the, longer, the, the greater the number of points, see, because sometimes in preaching, less is more. The more you say, the less people get it. And sometimes the less you say, the more people get it. Ellen White wrote to a particular preacher, and she said, God has shown me that your sermons would be twice as good if they were half as long. <laughs> God has shown me that your sermons would be twice as good if they were half as long. In other words, less is more. Three points remembered is better than five points not remembered. OK, so far so good? So here's your main points, then your conclusion, your story, and then your appeal. OK? So what I like to do is, and I've, I've mentioned this before in our Bible study lessons, tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Make sense? Now, the reason for that is not because people are stupid. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that not everybody you're preaching to are auditory learners. Okay? Your auditory learners are going to get whatever it is you say. But the people who learn primarily more visually or more through tactile means, you have to really spell it out for these kinds of people. Okay? One of the greatest compliments that I have ever gotten and, and, and seem to get reasonably consistently in my preaching ministry is people say, you know, I'm not somebody who learns very well from hearing things, but I feel like when you preach, I get it. Well, that's a great, I take that very, very seriously and I give all the glory to God because the reason is you're always going to get the people that are interested. Always. You'll get the choir. You get the ones who like you, who believe what you're saying, and who learn how you speak. But your goal is to get the rest. Your goal is to get everybody else. Anybody can preach to the choir, okay? But you want to get everybody as much as is possible, okay? And that means different, uh, the youngest to the oldest. One of the best ways to gauge the success of a sermon that you preach in your church is are the young people paying attention? Are the nine-year-olds and the ten-year-olds and the eight-year-olds? Uh, if my son comes up to me, Landon, and he says, Papa, I enjoyed that sermon today, that means something to me. Because if my nine-year-old is getting it, anybody else can get it. If, my if I say, Landon, what was the sermon about today? He's like, ah, uh, I don't really remember. I didn't grab his attention. I didn't get his attention. And it's, it's difficult for me to force a nine-year-old to listen to something that doesn't make any sense to him. Okay? So that's a very good litmus test. Just a few things here that you definitely should be doing in your preaching. You should definitely be doing. Um, the first one there, have a simple, single purpose statement. Okay? A simple, single purpose statement. Definitely have that. Number two, announce the purpose and outline toward the beginning of the sermon and repeat several times. Again, I call this giving the lay of the land. So just... There's, there's, no, there's nothing lost. There's no harm in reminding people over and over again in the sermon. You don't want to do it ad nauseum. But there's nothing wrong with several times in the context of the sermon saying, so today we're looking at, our purpose today is to show that the Bible is trustworthy. And remember, we're examining three points. Who wants to tell me what the first one was? The Bible's unique claims. What's the second? The Bible's unique content. content. The Bible's unique consistency. Very good. And now we're going into our third point, the Bible's unique consistency. Okay, so nothing wrong with reminding people. Reminding people.